camp meeting. Wow, thank you, Shelley. Good morning. Good morning. And happy Sabbath. happy Sabbath. Are you doing good this morning? Amen. I have to tell you as we get started that my daughter Amber looks a lot like me, her daddy. I mean a lot like me. Now before you go feeling sorry for the poor girl, I want you to exercise your imagination, look at these features, and imagine this face in the female version. <laughs> what are you imagining? Not bad, huh? <laughs> I want to tell you that Amber is the beautiful female version of me. The features are softer, smaller, a little more roundish. And I have a number of times, as this little girl was growing up, I have endeavored to apologize to her for looking so much like me, but it doesn't seem to bother her. One time we were traveling internationally, and we were going to an Eastern European country, and we got stopped at customs. And this was at a time when a lot of children were being abducted and, and sold on the black market all over the world, and so you can imagine that they were being very careful, especially men traveling with young girls. And the customs officer stopped us, and she looked straight past me into Amber's eyes, and she said, tell me, who is this man to you? And Amber was a little nervous, and she looked up to her daddy, and uh, the customs officer said, no, you answer the question. And Amber said, a matter of factly, she said, well, he's my dad. And uh, the customs officer said, I don't think so. You're too old and he's too young. <laughs> That's what she said. And then Amber and I, without even speaking to one another, we got the same idea, just flashed into our minds. And I looked at her, she looked at me, and I gave a nod. We knew what to do. And we flashed a twin profile for the customs officer. <laughs> and I said, hey, customs officer, look really carefully at our face, especially the nose. And she smiled and she said, you are definitely related. <laughs> and she passed us on. It was that simple. Shortly after that, Amber and I were back home and uh, I was hanging out in her room and laying there on her bed, just looking around at all the new stuff she had hung on her wall. She had decorated her room, and I wanted to just check out her decorating job. And I noticed that she had hung a framed picture of her dad on her wall when I was 13 years old. She had found this photo somewhere in the house. Clean-shaven, long, blonde, Southern California surfer hair, 13 years old. And it was hung there, and I looked at that photo and I said, Amber, have you noticed? I mean, have you really noticed how much like me you look? And she said, yeah, Dad, I've noticed. And I said, sweetie, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I want you to know you are so pretty. And uh, she said something to me that just lifted my daddy heart that I will never forget. My little girl looked at me and she said, Dad, I like looking like you. And I left Amber's room and I got to thinking, wow, I think that's the kind of thing. If God could hear anything from you and me, that's what God would like to hear from you and me. Father, we like looking like you. And Father, we know we're not like you but we sure want to be. Amen. We long to reflect your character, your image to this world that is enveloped in darkness and doesn't know you. Daddy, we want to look like you. But right here, we are faced with a very serious problem because while we may want to be like God, we know we're not like him as we ought to be. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But longing to be like our Father poses the significant practical problem of how. What is the practical problem we're faced with? How? How are we fallen 
human beings, mere, finite human beings, how are we to become more like our Father and reflect His image? I want to share with you this morning what I regard to be the secret of spiritual empowerment. Capital T, capital H, capital E, the one and only singular, solitary secret of spiritual empowerment. I don't have a list for you of options to choose what might work for you. What I do have for you is one solitary secret that will open before you, open before me, a spiritual journey that will cause us to gradually be transformed into the image of God from glory to glory, from one stage of character development to the next. Do you want to know that secret? Oh, I can't tell you yet because it's a secret. So we're going to open it by increments. We're going to open it piece by piece so it really sinks in and makes an indelible impression upon us. So we are looking now in the scriptures for the secret of spiritual empowerment. This is the secret by which we may gain every victory in our lives and without which no victory may be gained. Now, in order to come at this subject, I want you to note with me that in Scripture, there are three kinds of power. How many kinds of power? Three kinds of power that I want to draw your attention to. Now, the first of this trilogy of powers is miraculous power. What kind? Miraculous. miraculous. Now, miraculous power is that power by which God either suspends or bypasses the laws of nature to cause something to occur that is completely outside of the realm of human involvement. We just stand back in amazement and we say, whoa, praise the Lord, amen. Look at what God has done without my involvement or participation. Miraculous power occurs when God suspends or bypasses the laws of nature. Now, by the way, there is no such thing as a miracle from God's perspective. Nothing ever happens that's supernatural for God. Everything's natural for Him. Are you with me? God does whatever He wants to do, and there are no obstacles, and He never taps into a power that supersedes Him. He never draws upon an external source of power. Are you with me? So God does what God does, and from our point of view, we say, oh, that's a miracle. It's supernatural to us. It's natural to Him. Now, there are many examples of supernatural power or miraculous power in the Bible. In Exodus 9 and verse 16, we read these words. God, speaking to Moses, said, But indeed, for this purpose, Moses, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, the context of this scripture. When God says, Moses, I've raised you up to show my power in you. The context here are the plagues that came upon Egypt. Moses went to Pharaoh and said, God has a message for you, Pharaoh. Let my people go. And he repeatedly refused. And so God, through Moses, performed a series of miracles, supernatural events that got Pharaoh's attention but his heart never softened. He continued to be defiant even when he let the people go. Moses then went into the wilderness with the people. He tapped the waters of the Red Sea with his staff and the waters parted. A miracle occurred. But please note, Moses could not, with that same staff, tap the sea of people that he was leading through the wilderness and get them to cooperate. 
They were a stiff-necked and rebellious people, and the staff that could perform the miracle of parting the sea could not perform a miracle to change the deep inner interior of human hearts. That lies within the realm of the secret power we're about to discover. So there's the power of miracle in Scripture. When Peter walked on water, God obviously suspended the law of gravity. And Peter walked on water. Natural for God, supernatural for Peter. <clears throat> and yet, Peter's heart could not be similarly suspended by miraculous power. It was a longer, more tedious relational process that Jesus moved through with Peter to change his heart. Are you with me so far? So while miraculous power has its place and its use, miraculous power is outside of the purview of changing the human heart. I experienced miraculous power a number of times in my life. I remember Esther from Mexico who came to visit family in the United States of America. And she was a 26-year-old, highly educated young physician. And she was an atheist. And her relatives, who were friends of mine, brought her to introduce her to me so we could change her, so we could convert her. They wanted me to give her Bible studies, and they were hoping that this would have its effect upon her. Esther and I became friends through this series of days that we studied the Bible together. Pretty good friends, but she didn't speak any English, and I didn't speak any Spanish except for what I had learned at Taco Bell, taco, burrito, tostada. That's it. <laughs> so her cousin Juan was our continual translator, the go-between. And I would give Bible studies through Juan to Esther. And she kept smiling, and she would say things, you are my friend, through Juan, the translator. You are my friend. I like you, but I don't believe anything you're saying. <laughs> and then, just before she had to go back to Mexico, there was a camp meeting that I was to speak at, and I invited the family and Esther along, and they came, and I said, Esther, this message is for you. Please be there with your translator, cousin Juan, on the front row, and he can whisper the message to you. As I rose to speak that Sabbath morning, I saw Esther, but I didn't see Juan. And I began to get nervous, and I thought, this message is for her. This is my last chance. Where is Juan? But I had no choice. I had to go with the schedule. There's time on the clock. And I delivered the message. Occasionally, I glanced down, and I saw that she nodded a few times. And I thought, wow, her English is getting better in just a few days. Finally, at the end of the message, after the prayer, amen, here comes wandering Juan. He had been all over the campgrounds, but he wasn't where he was supposed to be. I said, dude, where were you? This is your cousin. She needed you. You were supposed to translate. And she was frantically trying to get my attention through Juan, trying to say something. I said, Juan, she is very upset at you. And she said, no, no, no. And she spoke through Juan and she said, tell Ty that I understood everything he said in my own language. I said, you're lying. That didn't happen. <laughs> she said, no, it did happen. And her eyes began to tear up. And I said, tell me what I said. <laughs> and she explained the message. And I was overwhelmed. And we got on our knees and we prayed. And she gave her heart to the Lord. Esther went back to Mexico and three months later died of a disease that was latent in her body that she didn't even know about during our visits. God, just in the nick of time, performed that miracle. But listen very carefully now. The miracle was merely the catalyst for the message to get into her heart. The miracle itself was not the transforming power on the inside. Amen. Miracles have their place. But listen, you would never go to your knees at the end of a day 
and say, Lord, I had a bad day. I lost my temper. My mind wandered where it ought not. God, I need victory in my life. Lord, please, I'm going to go to sleep tonight. And while I'm asleep, I want you to perform a miracle. Turn some screws in my head. Rewire it. Do something while I'm sleeping. And, and how many of you would expect to wake up the next morning? Perfect. Perfectly happy and holy and cuddly and kind and nice, never to struggle with temptation again, never to have to employ your will again in the battle with sin. How many of you would expect God to turn those screws in your head and by a miracle bypass your will to make you perfect? Nobody would expect that kind of result. And the reason why is because we intuitively know from our reading of Scripture, we may not be able to quote chapter and verse, but we know, we've read enough to know that God is up to something deeper than merely controlling, modifying, or somehow governing outward appearances. We know that God is trying to get deep on the inside of us to bring about lasting change that arises from a personal voluntary yielding to God. We know that, so we wouldn't pray that kind of prayer, and we certainly wouldn't expect such a miracle to be performed. So there's miraculous power, and it has its place. But then there is the second kind of power, I named it, that is authoritative power, the power of just raw authority. For example, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 4, Solomon says, where the word of a king is, there is power. And who can say to him, what are you doing? Do you get the gist here? Solomon says there is a kind of power that is invested in position and rank, right? Where the word of a king is, there is power power. And who can say to the king, what are you doing? The king's word is the authoritative bottom line in the kingdom. Where the word of a king is, there is power. Please notice in Luke, excuse me, Psalm 66 and verse 3, through the greatness of your power, God, your enemies will submit themselves to you. Your enemies will what? submit themselves to you according to philippians chapter 2 you remember let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in very nature god thought it not something to be grasped to be equal with god but made himself of no reputation taking upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What kind of power do we see here? We see a power that is brought to our attention here in Psalm 66, by your power, the greatness of your power, God, your enemies even will submit to you. Every knee will bow. The devil and all his unholy hosts will get on their knees when all is said and done and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even your enemies will submit to you finally, God. But listen very carefully. James said, yes, the devils do believe. And they tremble at what they believe. Question, are the devils transformed for all their believing? When the devil himself is on his knees, when all is said and done, confessing the truth of the matter, is he changed by that confession? No, because authority is like miraculous power. Authoritative power is a kind of power that does not bring about internal change. Authority has its place. God spoke the world into existence, and matter itself obeyed. You remember when Jesus sent out the 12, and then he sent out the 70? And he said, I give you 
authority and power over all the demonic hosts. And they came rushing back at one point and said, even the demons obey us. Yet the demons obeyed, but the demons were not transformed. They simply yielded to the raw authority of God. God is powerful in an authoritative sense. I mean, he is an enormous, majestic, incredible creator, God, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent. God is the most incredible source of authority in the universe. He speaks and things happen. That's why Jesus had to be very specific when he raised Lazarus from the tomb. He didn't just say, come forth. He said, Lazarus, come forth. If Jesus would have just said, come forth, all that are in the graves would have come forth and been resurrected. No, 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 just Lazarus right now. And Lazarus came forth. There is an authority that God has. And authority has its place. But listen very carefully now. The authoritative power of God, he employs for those purposes to which it lends itself to get done what God wants done with authority. But there is something God does not want to achieve by sheer rank, position, and authority. Yes, there is. For example, let me illustrate. If I were to pull a revolver from my pocket right now, it is, in a sense, an implement of power. But it is an implement of power with which I could only manipulate your behavior, right? If I point the gun out and I say, stand up right now, what would you do? Stand You'd stand up. Most of you would, except for the ones with good, strong German lineage. You would press the point a little bit. <laughs> but the rest of you, you would stand up. And then what if I said, sit down now, what would you do? You'd sit down. Stand on your head. You'd try, right? <laughs> now, you just agreed with me to a very basic human reality. You agreed that with an implement of authority, power, force, manipulation, that I could manipulate your behavior. Stand up, sit down, stand on your head. Make me fettuccine alfredo with baby asparagus and focaccia bread now, right? I could get you to do things behaviorally with a gun in my hand. But what if in the next breath, stand up, sit down. What if in the next breath I said, love me right now. Be my friend, my best friend, in fact. I want you right now to feel loyalty and trust for me. Feel it now. Would you feel it? No, actually, you'd feel the opposite. Because you know, don't you, if you stop and think about it, you know that force and love are mutually exclusive. You know that manipulation through externally imposed authority you know that manipulation cannot produce trust or love or loyalty. Don't you know that? Yes, you do. And so that's why young men do not propose to young women with revolvers. <laughs> right? If you think about it, it looks like a foolproof method to get your bride, right? You will marry me, won't you? But listen, that implement of force is not suited to the aim of the suitor toward his potential bride, is it? Because he's not aiming for mere outward compliance, is he? He's not looking for a slave. He's looking for a best friend and lifelong lover. That's what he's looking for. And the only way that you get a best friend and a lifelong lover is to put the pistol away <laughs> and go through the longer relational process of proving yourself worthy 
of her affections, of her trust, of her loyalty, of her love. So if you stop and think about it, you know as well as I do that while miraculous power has its place, and while authoritative power has its place to get done certain things in the universe, neither of these sources of power are sufficient to the ultimate aim that God has in mind for you and me. Because God, again, is not looking to make machines or computers out of us, or he would just download information. If he wanted to do it that way, he could download a worship program, and we would just stand in his presence saying, holy, 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 because the program would dictate. And that program, he could write in such a way that at a certain time each day, we get on our knees before him. He could even program us to say, we love you, but would we? Because when the program says, say you love him, who's doing the speaking, really? The one who did the programming. God is saying, I love God, but me? Well, in fact, there is no me. There is no personal, individual, autonomous identity. I'm a machine, a shell, a nothing. But God didn't make us as machines. God didn't make us either as slaves. He didn't say, I'm going to put the whip to your back. So if you know what's good for you, this is my universe. I'm God. You're not. And I call the shots around here. Basic arrangement. You do what I say. Or else, what would we do? We'd do what he says or else. But would we love him? Would we trust him? Would there be a deep, personal, voluntary sense of loyalty in our hearts toward him? No. In fact, deep on the inside, secretly, we'd be his enemies. All slaves are the enemy of the enslaver, even while going through the motions outwardly to do what they're told. Right? So God is aiming for something more, something higher, something deeper, something incredible. What is God aiming for? Jesus touched upon it in one of the most profound statements he ever made while he was on this earth. In John 15, 15, he said to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants because the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I... God Almighty in human flesh, I have called you friends because everything the Father has told me, I've made known to you. In other words, Jesus says, I don't want a slave-master relationship with you. I want a friendship with you. I want a relationship with you that is governed not by the externally imposed authority that I could impose on you. I mean, after all, I am God. And if I was simply seeking to get something done outwardly, I could make you go through the motions. But no, 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 Jesus says, I want you to be my friends. And that was the highest compliment that God paid anyone in Scripture. He said of Moses, Moses is my friend. Friend. He said of Abraham, Abraham is my friend. He said of David, David is a man after my own heart. That is to say, David has a heart like mine. We resonate with one another. I like the way David thinks and feels. David is a man after my own heart. Now, friends, this brings us to the third kind of power, the secret source of spiritual empowerment and transformation by which all victories may be gained and without which not one victory may be gained. We are now positioned, by contrast, to see this third kind of power. I say by contrast because we have noted the benefits and the shortcomings of miraculous power. We have noted the benefits and the shortcomings of authoritative power. 
So what is this third kind of power? I introduce it to you with 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. Turn there and look very carefully for the word power, and you will notice a usage of the word power that is absolutely astounding. Notice here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, what word are you looking for, by the way? Power. power. Here it is, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. Paul says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but, listen carefully, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the power of God in this verse? The message of the cross is the power of God, according to Paul. Now, what kind of power is this? Is it miraculous power? Well, in fact, we don't witness any miracles occurring at the cross, really. Not in the true classical sense. I mean, you could say that the conversion of the thief on the cross was a miracle. From a human perspective, we might look at it that my conversion was a miracle, if you want to look at it that way. But in the true, concrete, biblical sense of God suspending some kind of forces around me to make me something I don't really want to be? No. They said, if you're the son of God, come down and save yourself. Question, could he have? Yes. Yeah, he could have come down and laid them all waste. But he didn't use that miraculous power to deliver himself. He stayed there by a different kind of power. There was a different kind of power that held Jesus captive to the cross, a willing captive. He said in John 10, no one takes my life from me. I just want you to know that up front, he says. You think that you're about to kill me, and indeed you are. In your motives and in your actions, you will be guilty. But no man really takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. Jesus didn't go to the cross with his back against a wall with no way out. As the song says, he could have called 10,000 angels at any point in the process and delivered himself and abandoned you and me. But a different kind of power held him there. A different kind of power was operating in Jesus at the cross. So Paul says, the message of the cross is the power of God. Now, let's flesh this out a little bit. What kind of power is Paul talking about here? It's not miraculous power. It's not authoritative power. We don't see at the cross Jesus pulling rank, position. What kind of power do we witness at the cross? Think of John 12, 32 to begin with. I want you to notice a very key word here. Jesus said of the cross, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, referring to what event? the cross, right? I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will, and what's the word? Draw, draw all peoples to myself. The operative word is draw. What does it mean to be drawn? This word shows up again in a similar kind of context in Jeremiah 31.3. You remember what the Lord said there? Jeremiah says, the Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, I have loved you, I have what? Loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. There's the word again. God is operating for our salvation, <clears throat> for our transformation, with a different kind of power, a power that draws rather than pushes, a power that attracts rather than forces. Because I love you, God says, therefore, with love I will draw you. I, if I be lifted up, will draw you. What is the word draw? Give me a synonym for the word draw. To pull, to attract. Jesus says, in essence, I'm going to present before you something very attractive. But you look at the cross, and is it really all that attractive? 
torn flesh, blood flowing freely. He's broken. What's the power? What's the attraction? Well, you've got to look past the torn flesh to what's going on in his heart and in his mind as he focuses on you. Why is he torn, bruised, and bleeding? What is the motive that is actuating his heart? What has driven him to such radical, extreme measures on our behalf? What is this power? According to Jesus, it is a drawing power. And now we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul names this power explicitly. Notice this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. Do not miss this scripture. It is so amazing what Paul introduces us to here. Chapter 5, verse 14. Notice, speaking of the cross, Paul says, the love of Christ, what does your version say? Does what? constraineth us. That's the King James Version. Let's go with that for a minute. The love of Christ constraineth us. What does it mean to be constrained? Well, think of it this way. What does it mean to be restrained? To be restrained means to be held back. What does it mean to be constrained? To be propelled? The version renders it, for example. The love of Christ urges me on. That's how it renders the New King James Version uses the word compels. The love of Christ compels us. Now, notice this carefully. What is the compelling force in this text? What is the power that's operating in this text? The love of Christ. Now, notice carefully. The love of Christ compels us because we thus, what? Judge. That is, we discern that if one died for all, then all died, and that he died for all so that those who live, I'm in verse 15 now, should no longer live for who? For themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Read that scripture again later on today, and you will notice that Paul basically says that the love of Christ is the power by which God gains in us the most foundational victory of all. The victory from which springs all other victories. He says the love of Christ compels us to cease living for ourselves, but rather for him who died for us and rose again. That is to say, when we look to the cross of Calvary, we discern in him, we see in him a love that begins to operate in our hearts to produce a responsive love. So, Paul says, the love of Christ causes us to stop living for who? For self and to begin living for Him. There's a voluntary action here. This is an internal victory that's being gained. Notice Ephesians chapter 3. And now it will become abundantly clear what the gospel is pointing us to. Or Ephesians chapter 3, this incredible prayer of the Apostle Paul, starting with verse 14, for this cause, for this reason, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, here's the prayer, that he would grant you, verse 16, according to the riches of his glory, to be what? strengthened, that's our consideration this morning, power, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, the inner person. Where is this strength occurring? In the inner man. This isn't a miracle being externally imposed. This is not authority being externally imposed. This is a strengthening on the inside, Paul says, in the inner man. Now watch this. Notice the source of this strength, this power. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able, and what's the word he uses now? To comprehend with all saints what is the width and length and depth and height. God's love is dimensional. It has no bottom. It has no cap. It has no 
edges. God's love is a multi-dimensional, beautiful character that we can behold for all eternity and never exhaust it. That you may comprehend the love of Christ which passes knowledge. It's beyond us to ever exhaust it or fully comprehend it, but we can comprehend God's love to the degree that it will empower us. So Paul goes on and he says, verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, now watch this, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How is it that we are filled with all the fullness of God, according to Paul? Through a comprehension of the love of God. The most basic law of human nature, all of us are governed by it without exception, is what we may call the law of beholding. By beholding, we become changed, derived from 2 Corinthians 3.18. But listen, we can state this law in another way. And that is to say that there is operating in human nature what we may refer to as the law of proportional effect. And it says this, the degree to which we comprehend and accept God's love for us is the degree to which we, in turn, will love Him. Love begets love. I love the statement in Desire of Ages that says, love gives birth to love. Now, Paul goes on and he says here, at the closure of his prayer, verse 20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And what's the last part there? According to the power which works where? In us. And according to the context, what is this power that works in us? It is the love of God. Christ. And how does that love, that powerful love, find access to the inner man? Through the medium, through the channel of comprehension. You want to know the secret? You want to know the secret of spiritual empowerment? You want to know the secret of victory? I'll tell it to you right now. That love infused becomes love diffused. That in fact, Love of God on the inside shows up on the outside. The more deeply we comprehend God's love for us, the more we in turn are made able, empowered to love all others and God. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 does something very interesting that you'll never want to forget. Paul says in Galatians 5 verses 5 and 6 that we wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. No outward form will avail in this matter. But verse 6, what does avail? Faith which works by love. Now, the reason this verse is so crucial is because the word works in the Greek is the word energeo, from which we get the English word energy. Paul literally says that faith is energized by love. Faith is made operable by love. Faith is awakened to action by God's love taking up residence in our hearts. And so I close with the words of John in 1 John chapter 3. Here is what we need to do. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God.